Matt Klein has worked for three rapidly growing internet companies. At Amazon Web Services, he worked on EC2, the compute-as-a-service product that powers a large percentage of the internet. At Twitter, he helped scale the infrastructure in the chaotic days before Twitter's IPO. Today, he works at Lyft, building systems to allow for ride-sharing infrastructure to work more safely and reliably. Hypergrowth internet companies are faced with quickly growing demands on their software. The demands on the software expose problems with the core infrastructure. As the demand ramps up, the infrastructure gets strained and it can lead to problems. Simultaneously, the company is trying to ramp up its hiring process. More engineers get hired and the institutional knowledge within the company starts to weaken. Your documentation gets out of date. Senior engineers get overworked, they burn out, and they leave the company. When a company starts growing quickly, everything can break down. Communications can break down, infrastructure can break down. It's a good problem to have, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to work through. A hypergrowth company can suffer from a lack of human scalability. Matt Klein has observed these challenges at Amazon Web Services, Twitter, and Lyft. In his article, The Human Scalability of DevOps, he explains why these problems manifest and what can be done to alleviate them. In a previous show, Matt discussed the engineering challenges at Lyft that led him to create Envoy, a service proxy. That show was highly technical. It was a great review of modern infrastructure. This episode covers some broad technical topics, such as DevOps and site reliability engineering and platform engineering, but the episode is mostly about how a hypergrowth company can manage culture and hiring and engineering organization and just general operations. Matt is a very fun guest to have on because he questions some of the strange practices that have been widely adopted by successful companies. Internet companies are a very new phenomenon, and the management tactics that they have adopted are not very well proven. We don't have a whole lot of data on how to run an internet company well. So it's great to have someone like Matt provide a fresh perspective on ways that companies can scale their technology and their organization more effectively. We talked a lot about culture and how to make an engineering culture that is appealing to engineers and how to retain those engineers. This is probably one of my favorite episodes that I've ever done because Matt talks really honestly. He's a fantastic engineer and he's also just got a holistic view of how a startup, how a big organization, how any organization that's moving quickly with technology can orchestrate the operations and the technology infrastructure of the company in an intelligent fashion. So I really hope you like this episode with Matt Klein as much as I did. OpenShift is a Kubernetes platform from Red Hat. OpenShift takes the Kubernetes container orchestration system and adds features that let you build software more quickly. OpenShift includes service discovery, CI-CD, built-in monitoring and health management, and scalability. With OpenShift, you can avoid being locked into any of the particular large cloud providers. You can move your workloads easily between public and private cloud infrastructure, as well as your own on-prem hardware. OpenShift from Red Hat gives you Kubernetes without the complication security, log management, container networking, configuration management. You can focus on your application instead of complex Kubernetes issues. OpenShift is open source technology built to enable everyone to launch their big ideas. Whether you're an engineer in a large enterprise or a developer getting your startup off the ground, you can check out OpenShift from Red Hat by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash redhat. That's softwareengineeringdaily.com slash redhat. I remember the earliest shows I did about Kubernetes and trying to understand its potential and what it was for. And I remember people saying that this is a platform for building platforms. So it's 
Kubernetes is was not meant to be used from raw Kubernetes to have a platform as a service. It was meant as a lower level infrastructure piece to build platforms as a service on top of, which is why OpenShift came into manifestation. So you can check it out by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash red hat and find out about OpenShift. Matt Klein, you are the creator of Envoy and an engineer at Lyft. Welcome back to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. Great to be here. You are an infrastructure engineer, and the last time you came on, we talked about Envoy. And your recent post was more about humans. It was called the human scalability of DevOps, and it was about the org structures and hiring processes of engineering companies. Actually, I guess this is not your most recent post anymore because you've written about open source since then, so we, we've got a lot to talk about. But I want to start by talking about this human scalability of DevOps article, because I thought it was, it was quite interesting. Why did you write this article? You know, it's a topic that's been top of mind for me recently. I think we're at an interesting point in the industry right now where we are moving towards a model of operating software, which is mostly cloud-based. Uh, you know, we're moving towards a, a bunch of serverless paradigms where, you know, we would like people to focus on business logic. And, you know, so we're, we're racing towards this theoretical world in which, you know, we don't necessarily need operations engineers. And, you know, I think people, we can have a, a long conversation, probably an entire hour on, on what DevOps actually means. But there's been a shift in the industry towards a general expectation that we have software engineers that will operate their own online services. So that's obviously figuring out, uh, you know, how, how to have alarms, how to observe them, how to monitor them, what what are the SLOs, what are the SLAs. So, you know, it's been top of mind for me to, to see this evolution all the way from 15 or 20 years ago where, you know, we would generally have operations engineers who would take software and maybe do some testing and then obviously ship that out to now we're doing continuous integration, continuous deployment. We're expecting software engineers to write software as well as actually ship it and then and then own it in production. And from an organizational perspective, I, I don't necessarily think that as an industry, we have figured out how to support people in actually being fully successful in those roles. And by support, I mean, you know, how do we educate them? So it's not like people learn how to operate reliable internet software in, in college. You know, they'll typically learn that on the job. So what type of new hire education, what type of continuing education do we, you know, do, do we offer people to learn those skills? Or how do we do documentation? Like how do we expose to people, you know, what systems are available, how they use them to do networking and data stores and observability and those types of things? And, you know, how do we get, get them help when they might not, you know, understand, you know, what are the right settings to use or what system they should use to solve a particular business problem. So I'll, I'll stop there and let you ask follow-ups, but I, I just think we're at a very interesting point where, you know, we're moving rapidly towards a world in which we want to enable people to move, move quickly and, and, and ship software. But I don't think we're necessarily fully supporting them and being successful doing that. And I think that that can create create organizational strife sometimes. Yeah. And you've seen this play out in its most acute form because the companies you, you've you worked at have been under tremendous load. They've grown extremely fast at the times that you were at these companies. So just to give people some background, you worked at AWS on EC2, which is the server infrastructure that underlies everything. You worked on pre-IPO Twitter you have now worked at Lyft through some of its busiest growth periods, and each of these were extremely fast-growing products. And so you see the most acute form of what happens when the business pressures, the growth pressures, the user pressures end up impacting engineering teams in a really big way. And I think companies that are growing in a slower fashion experience the same issues, but maybe in a less condensed time period. So it's not like these these are only issues that occur at the fast-growing startup internet companies. 
that they just occur in slower motion at other companies. How does the business pressure, that growth pressure at these kinds of high velocity engineering environments, how does that affect an engineering team? Yeah, and that's a great point. And I, I did point that out in my post where I think that my experience at working at these quote hyper growth companies is definitely, it's an extreme example of some of the problems that I'm talking about. And I think at companies that are growing uh, less quickly and, and possibly have less human growth expansion in terms of the number of people that they're hiring or the, or the business pressures or the revenue growth or those types of things, I agree with you. I think these things are going to, uh, they're going to exist, but they're not necessarily going to be quite as acute. So, you know, I, I think hyper growth companies, particularly internet hyper growth companies, you know, we have we have increasingly moved into a world where, you know, everything is always on, everything is 24 seven, everything is app driven, you know, people are iterating very quickly, both in their lives, but also from a product perspective, there's a general perspective or a general feeling that, you know, people should be able to ship changes 24 seven, and they should be able to, you know, iterate super, super fast and, and just adapt to the marketplace. So I think at some of these extreme hyper growth companies, like whether that be uh, Twitter or Lyft or early AWS or, or, you know, a bunch of other of the major unicorn type startups, you know, what you're seeing is you're seeing extreme business growth. You're seeing the general feeling that, oh, you know, we have lots to do. So let's, let's hire more people as quickly as possible. And again, we can have a, a long conversation about, you know, people have been writing and talking about this for 40 or 50 years now about, you know, whether adding more people to a software engineering project is going to make it, make it go faster. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But in general, at these hyper growth companies, you're seeing major human growth. So for example, I think Lyft, when I joined three and a half years ago, I want to say it had 80 engineers. And, you know, now we're probably about a thousand. So that's a, that's a 10 X growth in like three, three and a half years. And I think that's not totally uncommon. I think Twitter maybe grew even faster than that. And I think what you see is that, you know, some of the softer things that are not related to writing code, but are, but are really critical. And I'll, I'll come back to those. So education. So again, like how do we teach people when they're onboarding, what, what systems we have, how to use them, you know, how to find documentation. And then, you know, if we teach them how to find documentation, we have to actually have documentation. So, so like, where's that? What format does it use? How do you search it? How do we do support? You know, do you have a support queue? Do you have a clear understanding of where you are in that queue? Or do you use Slack and it's, and it's total chaos? And I think in general, again, I, I don't want to speak for the entire industry because my experience is mostly in this hyper growth space, but I have pretty good understanding of what many of the lift like companies are, are, are doing. And I know that this is a persistent problem at all of these companies. And I, I think where that you know, problem really rears its ugly head, and that's what I was talking about primarily in the blog post, is I think you can get into a situation where you create a lot of organizational angst. And it's mostly through, you know, people that are frustrated that they don't feel like they can do their jobs well. So for example, if you're a product engineer and you're building, you know, business logic features, obviously you're being judged on making the business move faster, on shipping a particular feature, on generating revenue for that feature. So you don't want to get held up on infrastructure. And I, and, and I say this in most of my talks that unless you're an infrastructure company, infrastructure is basically overhead. Like no one makes money on building infrastructure. So, you know, any time that you have an application engineer that's uh, building infrastructure or fighting with infrastructure, not building business logic, you know, that's time that's uh, essentially being wasted. So, you know, there can be some, some angst that comes up where a product engineer, rightfully so, you know, if we don't teach that engineer what technologies to use or uh, where the documentation for that technology is or how to get support when there's when there's a problem you know they can feel very frustrated and on the infrastructure side if you're building infrastructure for a company like Lyft you know you're not building low level databases now you're mostly leaving that towards towards a cloud provider but you still have a lot of complicated stuff to do around networking and databases and observability and and 
like stitching together a, a system that people can 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 use and build their business logic on. And if you're an infrastructure engineer and you're trying to keep the lights on at a hyper growth company that's having traffic growth and you're trying to do support, but the support isn't well organized, you know, it's somewhat chaotic. Like I said, there might not be a queue. It's unclear who's supposed to be doing the support. You can also have a bunch of angst and a bunch of anger on the infrastructure side when they feel like that they're not able to do the rest of their job or catch up or, you know, get on with their tech debt. And you get into the situation, which I've seen a bunch of times where now, you know, you have angst on both sides. You have angst on the infra engineer side. You have angst on the product engineer side. And that can be pretty brutal from an organizational perspective, you know, and, and I think a lot of the conversations around how do we deal with this? Do we do it with education? Do we do it with, uh, again, do we do a documentation, uh, support systems? Do we have SREs? You know, what's the right model here? There's no consistent answer right now within the industry. And I, I think it's a really crucial problem that we have to deal with right now. It almost sounds like a new flavor of the breakdown between developers and operations is product engineering, trying to ship things faster and work with their PMs and so on. And then the product engineering team is interfacing with the infrastructure team or the quote platform engineering team and saying, hey, we, we, we want to ship this new feature. And the platform engineering team is saying, we, we've got this giant backlog of things around observability and just making the platform run properly and our slack channel is totally oversubscribed and you know has has alerts out the wazoo and we've got alert fatigue and we just had three engineers go on leave last week because they're burnt out i guess it's not as adversarial as the dev and ops breakdown because at least we've learned to communicate with each other but you do have a couple classes of teams that are at odds I think you're exactly right. And I think you're also right that we've learned as an industry that the walls where you have dev, you have QA, you have ops, those walls are not, you know, they're not the most efficient way to ship modern software. But at the same time, you're exactly right. I think we have new roles. You know, we have this platform or infra engineer role. We have, you know, the product engineer role. We have uh, some companies have this SRE type role. And I think part of the problem, you know, if I were to really pinpoint it is I think as a, as an infra, you know, as a group of infra engineers, and I'm talking about at companies like Lyft, but also from the cloud providers, we have this, you know, feeling now that the, the platform is available. The platform just works. You come and you have a database and you have all of those things and, you know, you can build your fantastic serverless infrastructures and it just gets monitored and everything is absolutely amazing. So, you know, we have this vision where operations engineers are no longer necessary or even reliability engineers. Some companies might not think that they're totally necessary or even infra engineers. Why would you have an infra engineer if the cloud provider or the serverless platform or the PaaS system is providing you with all of these primitives? But what I think, and I actually think that vision is fantastic. And I think if you look out, you know, 10 years, I can totally buy that that the majority of uh, software is being written on these you know magical serverless platforms where you show up and use these base primitives and and things mostly work. But where that breaks down is it break down it breaks down in, in two ways. The first way is that we I don't think our infrastructure is as good as as people think it is right right now, and I, I think things don't quite work fully reliably well, you know, particularly for operating high scale real time systems, you know, for companies like Twitter and Lyft and Uber and companies like that. I, I think we like to think that these platforms are plug and play and you just run it and, and they just work. But the reality is that the, the infrastructure and the tooling that we have today, it still requires a substantial amount of handholding and a substantial amount of wrapping you know, of putting together a platform at a company through deployment to testing to, again, how people do networking or databases or caching or observability. You know, we have to we have to wrap these things up and, and give it to people in a way that makes sense, even on top of something like AWS. So, you know, that's the first part of how it how it breaks down. I just don't think that we have this vision. I don't I don't think we're there yet. We're heading there, but we're I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. 
The, the second point of, of where it breaks down is that I, I don't think that you're ever going to be able to remove, you know, this concept of reliability engineering or an operations focus. And the reason that I say that is that, you know, a big part of running a reliable system is understanding your customers, like understanding what business metrics actually matter to your customer and figuring out how to how to measure that at the customer. So for for Lyft, you know, uh, of course we monitor things like, you know, what is our overall success rate? Like is it 99.99% or or something like that. And, and these are these are valuable things that you can alarm on and get a general sense of of, of what's going on. But ultimately for Lyft, you know, we can be serving at the server 99.99% success rate, all HTTP 200s, but it can all be JSON that's busted, that's causing the client to crash and no one's taking any rides, right? So, you, you know, there's a much larger problem here of figuring out from a business perspective, how do you reliably roll out software with your business? Like what feature flags do you use? How do you measure it at the client? What are the business metrics that matter? How do you measure that week over week, hour over hour? So my larger point is that even as we move towards a more magical serverless type infrastructure, that doesn't preclude us from understanding these concepts. So even in 10 years, even you know, 20 years, 30 years, there's still going to have to be an, an, an operations or a reliability focus to how we build software because we have to know and understand how to measure things from the business perspective and how to safely roll out software that doesn't break the business and that can be very business dependent. So, so I think that's where we're breaking down right now. I think we've just, we've really swung too far as an industry to thinking that infrastructure is magic and it is the solution to all of our problems with infrastructure as code. And don't get me wrong, I, I think we can do a lot from an infrastructure perspective and, and we can consolidate a lot of roles that or a lot of functions that would have previously been there. But I think that we've swung, we've swung a little hard and we don't recognize how important all of these other things are in terms of reliability, operational agility, you know, education, documentation, support, right? And I just don't think we focus on that enough and that's creating problems. Today's show is sponsored by Datadog, a monitoring and analytics platform that integrates with more than 250 technologies, including AWS, Kubernetes, and Lambda. Datadog unites metrics, traces, and logs in one platform so that you can get full visibility into your infrastructure and your applications. Check out new features like trace search and analytics for rapid insights into high cardinality data. And Watchdog, an auto detection engine that alerts you to performance anomalies across your applications. Datadog makes it easy for teams to monitor every layer of their stack in one place. But don't take our word for it. You can start a free trial today, and Datadog will send you a t-shirt for free at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog. To get that t-shirt and your free Datadog trial, go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog. have had experience at Twitter and Lyft, and these are products that were built in a certain time frame. Well, they were built in two different time frames. The original code for them were built in different time frames along the cloud infrastructure timeline. I would say Lyft, was, which is the company you work at now, it was started before some of these serverless products came to market in a way that they would be digestible to a company like Lyft. Like, it's hard for me to imagine Lyft running on Heroku or Firebase. I don't think it would be impossible, but these do seem like... Uh, like, I haven't heard of, of any giant companies, really gi giant companies, that are entirely on Heroku or entirely on... Firebase. And so, but I think we'll get there eventually. Maybe it looks like 
AWS Fargate and you and you have like a collection of Fargates or or you know the Azure container instances or the Google whatever the Google equivalent of those maybe that's like the serverless backbone that you can start with but even then it's like not really quote serverless because these are servers basically they're just they just happen to be standalone containers instead of VMs they're just like cheaper more discardable servers so I, I'm of two minds when when it comes to this question of like do we have the things to build serverless at Lyft at a company like Lyft today but I think we should we should probably talk more about about how you are actually seeing things at Lyft because you have a lot of wisdom to convey here and I think one place that we could touch on is this question of the human capital that you're bringing on to your team so you have this term you call the fallacy of fungibility and I think this really articulates uh, some of the issues around hiring that you have seen at Lyft, or, or maybe at previous companies. What is the fallacy of fungibility? What do you mean by that? Well, just to start, it's it's not just Lyft. I've seen this at Amazon, I saw it at Twitter, and I've seen it at Lyft, and it definitely exists at a bunch of other companies. So I just want to be clear that I, I don't think it's a Lyft-specific thing, though I have experienced it here. I think over the last, again, this is more of a last 10 or 15 year phenomenon, and it parallels this move towards, you know, infrastructure as code or machine learning as code or operations as code. You know, it's essentially the idea that we can code or program our way around all problems. And therefore, we are all software engineers. And where where I see that most acutely, and I've seen this at almost every company, is that and from a fungibility perspective, it, it's the additional idea that not only are, you know, are, are all problems solvable with code or software engineers, is that you can take one software engineer and you can take them from one project and you can move them to somewhere else and they'll be totally productive. And, and there are companies that make it an explicit goal to actually hire this way that, you know, software engineers, I, you know, I don't want to go as far as to say cogs, but, you know, the idea is that they are replaceable units that can be, you know, slotted in and and they will they will do the task at hand. And I really think that this this could not be further from the truth. And I, I think it's not true for a variety of different reasons. Like just starting with personal interest, we have a large industry. You know, uh, there there are all kinds of things that, pe- that that people work on, from infrastructure to games to machine learning to firmware. To I mean, you know, it, it just like the list goes on and on and on. And, you know, just from a personal interest standpoint and like setting aside capability, there are types of problems that some people enjoy working on more than others. Like some engineers love debugging. Some engineers love love writing code. Some engineers like working on graphics. Some like working on client programming or web pages or uh, operating systems problems. And I'm not even talking about capability. I'm just saying that people have, have preferences. And in a you know competitive hiring environment, when people can move around, just because someone can work on something doesn't mean that they that they want to. And you know, I think we consistently see that when we have people work on things, you know, that they are not necessarily passionate uh, about, their productivity is is lower. Uh, you know, they might have more interpersonal problems. So you know, I, I think that can become problematic. And again, like I, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that. Everyone needs to be happy 100% of the time. This is this is work after all. But I take the general philosophy that given a, a competitive hiring environment, you know, that work should generally be a net positive. It's not always going to be awesome. But, you know, if we can't make people happy, say, greater than 50% of the time, we're, we're probably doing something wrong. So that, that's part one. Part two is I, I do think that there are capability differences and, and I'm not talking about intelligence. Like I'm just talking about that there are people that are just good at different things. Like some people are amazing, you know, empty file programmers. Like they can just craft new code in an empty file and, you know, it's going to come out in a more maintainable way with less bugs. There are people who are incredible debuggers or incredible, uh, you know, problem solvers. Like they can dive into a code base that they haven't seen before and, and fix almost anything. There are people that have incredible op- operations or 
reliability intuition. Like they just know how to, you know, go in and figure out how to roll out software and ship software in a, in a way that doesn't break the customer. And these skills, it's not that people can't learn them or can't improve on them. And, and, and of course that absolutely happens, but People are good at different things and often a good team is composed of people that are good at all of these different things. And, and I think that sometimes, you know, we can have a whole talk around how we, you know, how we do interview loops within tech. And, and I, I think it's very problematic because particularly in software engineering, you know, we're going to try to jam people through a stereotypical tech screen interview with some coding and some design, like a bunch of other things. But it's not necessarily indicative of either what they would do on a day by day basis, meaning like, are they really going to be writing a bunch of code? Or are they going to be doing, you know, incredible operational excellence that is having absolutely tremendous impact on the overall business. Well, let's figure out how to interview them for that and actually hire them. And I've just, I've seen a lot of people either, you know, get pushed out of an org because they don't feel, they don't fit a particular mold or not get hired because they can't pass a stereotypical software engineering interview loop when they would have amazing impact. And, and you know, that, that, that is frustrating to me. So that's the general concept of fungibility. And I, wish as an industry, you know, we would better recognize that people have things that they're better at, that, uh, you know, people have things that they like more and that, you know, we have to start thinking about software engineers and, and, you know, kind of the group of people that we build up together to work on larger projects as not interchangeable uh, cogs, but as people that have uh, discrete things that they can add to a larger project. And I think if we did that, you know, we, we would potentially have less, less overall problems because we'd have people that would be able to focus more on reliability or on operational excellence uh, or on education or on all of those things. And we just don't, we don't support that very well from my personal experience. This is a really important topic to me. And it's basically the reason why I left the software engineering industry and started a podcast around software engineering is because I was so tired of this mode of thinking, of this industrial age style thinking where, oh, you're trained to work on the assembly line, so we're going to put you on the assembly line. And some people are okay with that. I think this is something that's going to come back to really bite the big tech companies if they're not proactive about it. Because now, as a giant tech company, if you've got this one-size-fits-all, you know, maximize the funnel of people who can reverse a linked list of binary search trees that are formatted in JSON or these stupid problems, if that's your, your bar for hiring... Sure, you're going to get people who can solve those, and then the the ones who you know who who are able to fool the process because they're really good at memorizing this test. And I know because I was one of these people. They're going to enter the job. They're going to do your boring work that you give them, and then they're going to get sick of it. This issue it bothers me so much, and I I don't understand why it's so persistent. Other than literally nobody else wants to do the work, and this is the only way to snooker people into maintaining your terrible legacy code. I yeah, and this issue bothers me too. And I guess I will say two things. One, I think it actually goes even beyond software engineers. And I, I will give you a, a particular anecdote from from Lyft, which I I found particularly frustrating. And I don't actually mind sharing because it was so frustrating. So I think that one of the biggest ways that we can you know help infrastructure software, and, and I've said this a lot in a lot of different talks, is that I, I think we underinvest in the UI and the user experience of the tools that we're building. We build lots of config files, you know, we build lots of amazing systems, but we don't necessarily build portals. Like we don't build beautiful UIs to make it easier and more accessible for people to come in and interact with the overall system. And I think if we did that, we could build systems that people, it would require less documentation. Like it would be easier for them to figure out what's going on. So, you know, I actually found a user experience designer who was passionate about this and, and wanted to work on it. And she had a great portfolio and, and was super awesome. 
And I, you know, got her into Lyft and I had her meet with the design team and she did an interview loop and she actually got an offer. And then we went through this whole process of where the design team basically said like, well, we don't know how to support a designer in infrastructure. Like she would have to work on the app. And I won't go into further details, but it's very indicative of this larger problem where we have these roles. Like we have a designer and the designer works on the web page or on the customer facing app without thinking about the fact that we need some of these skills in different roles. You know, so I guess I just wanted to point out that this is a persistent problem within the industry. You know, coming back to your point of like, why do people do this? I have to be honest. I, I think I think Amazon has actually had a large part in pushing this forward. Amazon is an incredible company, but I think historically, you know, Amazon has thought of engineering just as another part of its of its warehouse effectively, you know? So uh, it's like always trying to optimize, you know, like how do we do uh, different things with the same set of people? I think it goes along the same lines of the open plan offices. You know, it's just, it's just the, ge- just the general feeling of like, we're all like, we're all the same. Like we're all going to work in like in a line and get, and get swapped out. What I would say is that I do actually think that people are realizing that this is problematic. So I think there is some light at the end of the tunnel because five or 10 years ago, I remember being at Amazon and really having some extensive arguments about this in terms of, because I think for Amazon, and I don't know if it still is, I haven't worked there in a while, like fungibility was actually one of their primary things that they actually hired for. And I I think Facebook, at least historically, has also been similar. And I think people are starting to back off from that because it's becoming clear, well, that it's a competitive space. People have different needs and desires. People are good at different things. And also, like, we need different skill sets to work on different things. So, you know, I, 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 I think people are starting to think about this, but I don't think it is in a consistent enough way, or I I don't know that we've really changed our overall thinking. And I I, I still butt up against this and it's frustrating. Well, just to give more color to what you're saying about Amazon, because Amazon was the last place that I worked before I started this podcast. And I just want to discount everything I'm about to say with the fact that I love Amazon. I am inspired by Amazon. Like there is no leader who has inspired me more than Jeff Bezos. And I think the company is also very introspective and it really does try to solve the problems among its workforce. And I hope that you know, some somebody at Amazon who who might be listening to this is, it can understand where I'm coming from in in saying this, and that I'm I'm really saying this out of a place of love for Amazon. But when I was at the company, I expressed a desire and a capability to work on other areas of Amazon than the thing that I was fungibly assigned to, and I just received no positive encouragement or or receptivity. From within the company, I've heard that actually. Th- I've heard of some actually material changes that came into place just after I left, which perhaps make that more you know make an engineer of the company more mobile. But you know the thing is, like I was there and I was like, I, I would just talk to people and I'd be like, you know, it's really amazing that like AWS enables us as engineers. We could leave and and build something for zero dollars, and this is like unprecedented. Like, hey, are you like are you guys seeing this? Like, this is pretty cool. Like, I can just go and leave and build a software company for zero dollars if I want to. And other people will be like, yeah, I, I mean, I'm fine working on this service that I don't really care about. And be like, how do you think that way? I mean, people are waking up to that. They could, they're could, they waking up to the fact that they could even go on Upwork and just be a developer for things that they love on Upwork and make a decent living. And like, that's the bo- like that is the lowest bar. And that's like, frankly, I think that sounds like a better existence than at a lot of tech companies. Like, you get to work on stuff that you love and make money, like, from home? Sign me up for that. I mean, obviously, you have the you have the green card issues, which, which you know, that's a whole other snookering in issue. Yeah, anyway, I think these are really important points, and I really, really hope they get addressed. Because I think there is a way to address them. There is a way to say, whether it's 20% time or 50% time or whatever, like, you work on the service that's that's not very interesting this percentage of time and you get to work on something that's interesting to you this other percentage of time and it's allocated to you and it's and you get to demand it and that like how is that not win-win that's what the situation should be 
Yeah, you know, there's that. And, and I think there's also just as companies grow and, and scale, I think there just needs to be a recognition that there are more specialized roles available. Again, like whether that be operations or reliability or like debugging or kernel programming or, or like something, you know, I think it's okay to allow people to specialize and to be happy in doing that if that's what they want. I'm not saying that we should force people to do that. I think if people want to be generalist engineers, that is absolutely fine. And that's a, that's a great thing too. And again, like I do see this changing. Like I, I know I haven't again worked in, in Amazon in a long time and I full full disclaimer, I'm also a big fan of Amazon. I believe Amazon has improved in this area, and I think other companies have have too. But like I was saying, we still butt up against this in terms of, you know, a team needs a particular role. That role is not not only is the normal software engineer interview not even applicable, they're just not even gonna do a normal software engineering role. And they're happy about that. And we're happy about that. So what, let's figure out a way to actually hire them. And, and so sometimes I feel like as companies scale, just there becomes enough bureaucracy around, you know, HR and like, what does the job rec look like? And like, how do we do this? And, uh, you know, and then people just, just, just stall. And I, I wish companies would facilitate, you know, more custom roles. And I, I feel like more people would end up being successful and happy. Well, that story of the designer, the designer who wanted to build internal UIs for infrastructure teams, this is actually this is related to, I was talking to the one of the VP engineering's at, or director of engineering at, at Stripe, Raylene Young. And I was asking her, I was like, Stripe seems like they're really trying to figure out how to do the nomenclature of, of engineering like or of teams. Like, what, how do you name designers? You want designers to feel free to work on different areas of the product, but you also want to give them KPIs and stuff. And this applies to these. It just is a challenge to figure out how you restructure a company where you can have these you know, maybe you optimize for workforce satisfaction or something like that. I mean, how are you solving this at Lyft? How are you, <laughs> are you solving it? You must, it sounds like you're dealing with these issues right now. I, I mean, it's a continuous discussion. I mean, I, I was in a meeting yesterday where, where this came up. So it's a, it's a thing that people are aware of. And again, this is not less specific. Like I don't, I don't want to sit here and, and seem like I'm bashing on Lyft. Like I, I think this is an industry-wide problem. Right. For, for the record, for the record, even Stripe, right. they were like, we, we don't know how to do this. <laughs> right. I don't think anyone kn knows how to do this. And I think as in all things management or tech management, you know, there are no easy answers here and people have good points on both sides. You know, you, you want to have discrete job roles so that you can have a clear set of levels and career progression. And if you don't have that, then how do people know what they're doing or what they're tracking for? So, I, I mean, it, you know, there are real problems here. Like, I'm not saying that this is simple. I'm not even saying that I know what the answer is. But I do know, you know, from being an engineer or a leader on on the ground, that I just wish that we were more adaptable in allowing slightly custom roles. It's like, call them a software engineer, but let's allow the interview to be a little customized because we kind of know what, what they're actually going to be doing, right? So I, I do think that there are gray areas here that we could enable, but it's hard. And there's just, there's, there, there's no answer here and it's a, it's a continuous problem. Managed cloud services save developers time and effort. Why would you build your own logging platform or CMS or authentication service yourself when a managed tool or API can solve the problem for you? But how do you find the right services to integrate? How do you learn to stitch them together? How do you manage credentials within your teams or your products? Manifold makes your life easier by providing a single workflow to organize your services, connect your integrations, and share them with your team. You can discover the best services for your projects in the Manifold marketplace, or bring your own and manage them all in one dashboard. With services covering authentication, messaging, monitoring, CMS, and more, Manifold will keep you on the cutting edge so you can focus on building your project 
rather than focusing on problems that have already been solved. I'm a fan of Manifold because it pushes the developer to a higher level of abstraction, which I think can be really productive for allowing you to build and leverage your creativity faster. Once you have the services that you need, you can deliver your configuration to any environment, you can deploy on any cloud, and Manifold is completely free to use. If you head over to manifold.co slash sedaily, you will get a coupon code for $10, which you can use to try out any service on the Manifold marketplace. Thanks to Manifold for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily, and check out manifold.co slash sedaily, get your $10 credit, shop around, look for cool services that you can use in your next product or project. There is a lot of stuff there, and... $10 can take you a long way to trying a lot of different services. So go to manifold.co slash sedaily and shop around for tools to be creative. Thanks again to Manifold. touch a little bit more on your article so the it was about these collection i mean i think this actually this this does relate to what we've been talking about or the, the, your article does relate to what we've been talking about because it is this question of human scalability it's almost like it doesn't feel like an engineering problem or a, a software engineering problem as much as what are we changing about org structure because we know that the way that we change the org structure is going to reflect how our product evolves over time and i think you know you've built out a platform engineering team at lyft which is you know one way of of solving one area of this human scalability problem now the last time that we talked we were talking about envoy and envoy was a solution to to very serious technical problems because it was it, it covered it spanned these issues of like we're afraid of deployment because we don't have good instrumentation around things and so you this was a standardization of of a certain aspect of instrumentation so that was 1.5 years ago how have the scalability problems if we're talking on a technical level have they changed today? Do you, do you still have kind of outage issues and observability issues that that are worth going into here? So yeah, and, and, you know that's a very interesting topic. In, in general, I think the type of scalability problems that we're having at, at at Lyft now are they're much more subtle via Envoy, via a bunch of work that you know people have been doing on our database systems, you know, a bunch of reliability on on various other pieces of the system. In general, at Lyft, we don't have. It is extremely rare. I can't. Even, I can't even remember the last one when we had a more base level distributed systems outage. You know, like we're like DDoSing ourselves, or some database is just down, or something like that. Like we don't really have those problems anymore. And our problems now, from a reliability perspective, I think are a lot more directly related to uh, the the types of things that I wrote about. In that article, meaning we are asking developers to operate their systems, but we don't necessarily educate them on the appropriate ways of doing that. So, you know, how do you monitor very small things that are very business specific? So I'll, I'll just make up some examples. So like from, from, from Lyft, you know, how do we know that our ETAs haven't regressed or uh, like, how do we know that we're using a proper pricing model or that, you know, prime time hasn't done something bad or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's all of these things around like payments and, and, and just, you know, very Lyft specific business things where a lot of our outages or a lot of our incidents, you know, they're more subtle business level things. Like they're not, you know, base distributed system things. And I think a lot of these outages ultimately, you know, could be better solved by figuring out, you know, how to expand this reliability culture out to the entire engineering org. And that's where you get into these larger problems. You know, how do we educate people? Because we cannot expect them to just know this. That's not fair, right? Like, that's just not fair. So what type of new hire education? What type of continuing education? What type of documentation? Again, how do we do support? How do we do design reviews, like production readiness reviews? How do we set SLOs, how do we set SLAs? 
these are things that we have not scaled very well at, at, at Lyft because we still do not have a SRE type type role. We are rectifying that, you know, and that's something that's that's being worked on. I, I think that's very common where, you know, companies when they're in their initial hyper growth stage, they're going to have a lot of, you know, really fundamental distributed systems problems. And then depending on their growth level, they'll continue to have them. But, you know, within an order of magnitude, those things typically get get solved. And then and then I think you get into these more subtle issues. So I think that, you know, from an organizational perspective, my impression is that we're now at that next level where we're trying to figure out, you know, we are fundamentally reliable, like Lyft doesn't just go down anymore, but we still have a bunch of different niggling issues, which might cause issues. So at that point, you know, let's figure out how to actually solve that. Like, let's figure out how to educate people and, and, and get the right systems in place to make that better. Yeah, and I think we can use this as an opportunity to once again applaud Amazon because I think they arguably led this. And this is what I see at at most fast-growing startups these days. It, it's an amazing development. We no longer have outages, and it's like what? Like we don't have system-wide outages anymore. It on like that is the norm. We have things that are like outages. We have serious problems with pricing, for example, because of a machine learning rollout mistake. But I mean, that's a whole different class of problems. And, and you know, in some ways, you could say, oh, an incomplete failure is worse than a complete failure. But you know, generally, that's not the case because people just need to get their rides from point A to point B reliably. Like that's that's the most important thing of our service. Yeah. yeah, you know, so I think that, but you know, this brings up the larger problem of okay, so it's great that as an as an industry, or at least from the you know larger hyper growth startup perspective, we're building technology that will hopefully allow people to not have some of these fundamental outages, but. You know, we, I think it's our goal to build, I, to build a hundred percent reliable systems. Like I, as for me, as a software and as a system engineer, really what I like about my job is I like building something that people will use and I want it to work a hundred percent of the time. Now, of course, like nothing works a hundred percent of the time. There's always bugs, but I'm of the opinion that if we're not striving to make it work 100% of the time, we're not doing well by our customers, whether those customers are the customers of the product or internal customers of infrastructure. So I, I think that it's great that we're making progress and we're making systems more reliable. The base level of reliability is definitely higher than it used to be. But now we're at that next level, which is, you know, let's tick off and let's solve those other more nefarious problems around, you know, around pricing or more subtle bugs. And that's and that's harder. But, but I think that's that's where we're at right now. OK, I know we're up against time. I wanted to just ask you a little bit about open source, not to open a can of worms. Uh, but I want to open that can of worms. So you started Envoy, which is one of the most successful open source projects in recent memory, and it, it's an infrastructure piece. So monetization of open source infrastructure is a classically difficult problem. Some companies have made it work really well. Some companies have completely uh, bombed tr trying to make it work. And we had this recent announcement of the Redis license change to the Commons Clause, uh, we've covered that a little bit in a previous episode, but maybe you could just give your perspective on the issue and the ways in which you believe open source is broken and hope that it can be fixed. <laughs> That's a tough one to do in a, in a couple of minutes. So we should we should probably circle back at some point okay. and do a larger larger one. But I can I, I can I'm gonna, just, I'm I gonna can... have Kevin Kevin Wang on uh, in the near future, and he uh, he seems like he's got a really balanced uh, yeah. position on it. So yeah, but I can I can just talk about it super briefly. And I, I think at a very high level, we are generally moving as an industry, particularly for infrastructure software, to essentially requiring software that we use to be open source. So for, for a variety of reasons, which I don't have time to go into now, I think people are increasingly skeptical of proprietary or closed source software. You know, not in all cases, but for fundamental infrastructure primitives for things like Envoy, they just want to have the comfort of knowing that they can see the source code, that if something really bad happened, maybe they could go, you know, 
uh, take it and actually edit it. So I think that's one thing. I think, you know, Startup by Linux and then a whole bunch of other projects have come up over the last 20 years or so. I think there's a general expectation that, uh, you know, like uh, software should be open. So I think at that time, you know, you come into this really meaty problem of, you know, people want open software. Uh, they want it to be very high quality, which takes, you know, high, high quality engineers who need to make a living and, and, or, you know, and then there's infrastructure around building the software. So, so who, who actually pays? And that's become very complicated. And what we've seen over the last five or 10 years is, you know, open source is funded really in one of two ways. It's the offshoot of a company that's making money some, some, some other way. So whether that be uh, Google with search or, or Facebook with their ads or, or something else or Lyft with their, their cars, open source is an offshoot of that. And then you have people that are starting companies around open source software and they are, you know, attempting to you know, make it open source because that's what's required. Uh, but then, but then they need to fund their own development. So then we get into business models, you know, whether that be open core, so making part of it free and part of it paid, you know, whether it be offering it as a service or something like that. So I, right now we're just in this difficult time. We want everything to be open, but. You know, there's always ulterior motives at play in terms of, you know, who's paying for it, why. There's the interesting role of foundations. And I would love to talk about this at length, but I just think that we're in a difficult time right now where it's unclear who is paying for the critical software that we actually rely on and how to keep that software open and impartial without uh, having ulterior motives uh, without potentially depending on software that might get altered later because of ulterior motives. And that's that's the complexity that we are in right now. All right. Well, we will certainly revisit this in the future. I'm sure we're, we're going to have more developments in the coming months around this this subject. So I don't think we'll have any shortage of subjects to discuss next time. Matt, thanks for coming back on the show. This has been really fun talking. Thanks so much. This was awesome. Failure is unpredictable. You don't know when your system will break, but you know it will happen. Gremlin prepares for these outages. Gremlin provides resilience as a service, using chaos engineering techniques pioneered at Netflix and Amazon. Prepare your team for disaster by proactively testing failure scenarios. Max out CPU, black hole or slow down network traffic to a dependency, terminate processes and hosts, each of these shows how your system reacts, allowing you to harden things before a production incident. Check out Gremlin and get a free demo by going to gremlin.com slash se daily. That's gremlin.com slash se daily to get your free demo of how Gremlin can help you prepare with resilience as a service. Wow. 